I used to be a carpenter. When I came to America, I, I, I learned how to be a carpenter. I was, I was a drug dealer, but also a carpenter. This buddy of mine, Dav, he, he had a side job for me to do on the weekends. He's, he calls me Fetch. So he says, hey, Fetch, do you want to do a side job at the weekend? I says, yeah, what is it? He says, it's at a fortune teller's up in Laguna Honda. You have to, you have to like, they, she wants to build a couple of walls or some shit. I was like, okay. But uh, the night before, I was on like a really bad bender, so I was, I was dying while I was working. And I was thinking about killing myself while I was working at this fortune teller's. And, uh, and I'm thinking, you know what? When I'm done here, I'll go to the fucking bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. And then I was thinking, fuck, you know, there's a net around the Golden Gate Bridge. So if you jump in the wrong place, you'll end up in the net. So I was thinking, fuck, knowing my luck, I'd probably end up in the fucking net, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I'm nailing my studs, and this is while I'm working, I'm debating with myself how I'm going to kill myself. And the fortune teller is watching me, and she, she looks at me, and she goes, Oh my God, you have a wonderful aura. And, uh, and and I was, I just, it was so ridiculous. I laughed out loud. The ridiculousness of what she said to me snapped me out of it for that day. It was so, so bizarre. Like I had so many of those moments. Yeah, little, uh, little interventions. Yeah. Today we're going to spin an addiction to recovery yarn, old school style. Uh, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now vibe. So gird your loins because this story is pretty fucking wild. The teller of said story is my friend, Richie Stevens. Richie is an Irish gangster turned actor turned sober storyteller, best known for playing, you guessed it, gangsters and hardened criminals in a long line of movies and television procedurals. Given Richie's past as a drug trafficker, a kidnapper, a drug addict, an alcoholic, and basically an all-around criminal himself, it's a bit of a real-life Barry situation, and it's a tale that he lets loose in his wildly entertaining and darkly comic new book, The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, which chronicles Richie's descent into the abyss and his slog to redemption. And also, it's currently being developed into a television series by the creators of the hit TV show, Silicon Valley. I've known Richie for about a decade. The arc of this guy's life is truly one for the record books. He's a hell of a storyteller. This one is gonna blow your hair back. The chaos and the insanity is off the charts, but it will also make you realize that if this guy could go from where he was to where he is today, that truly anything is possible. A little alert for the more squeamish out there. There's a fair amount of profanity and tales of violence throughout this conversation. But with that warning, please hit that subscribe button and enjoy the hang. It's 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 always cool when I get to have friends on the show. And I was thinking back to when we first met, and I can't remember the very first time, but it has to have been at least ten years. At least maybe nine, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you moved to you moved to LA in two thousand ten. Uh, no, I think it was 2013. Yeah. Oh, 2013. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, 13. maybe just under under 10 years. And I just I just remember I have like a vague memory of you just telling insane stories. And and I was thinking, this is God, man. This, this guy's full of shit. <laughs> There's no way this <laughs> stuff is real. You know. Well, yeah. That's that's the well, the first person to read like my original manuscript was the book agents. Well, besides my partners, uh -huh. and the original one was like really long. It was like. 105,000 words, 430 pages. And they read it twice and they were like, this is crazy. Like, it can't be true, but there's so much detail in it. It could be true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they were like, did this really happen? You know, uh -huh. like, this is great, but uh, how do we sell this? Because it's just like a crazy, just long on and story. on and on yeah, with like yeah. one insane story after the next. So, what was the decision to cut it down to be, you know, such a, a, a relatively small book? Well, so we rewrote the book. Like my original book was just all my experiences written down. And then uh, I partnered up with John and Dave because mm -hmm. they want to make a TV show out of it. And um, they were like, it's not really accessible. So we need to like reformat it somehow so it's relatable to people. Because most, sure. most people don't know who I am. So it's yeah. like, why do you care about this guy? You know, but yeah. um, so so I got sober with the using the 12 steps by going to meetings. 
And uh, they were like, why don't we format it like uh, how you got sober through the 12 steps and each chapter is, will be thematically written around a, a, a step. Right. So, so each each chapter is a step with your own kind of like spin on the sub the subtitle for that step. The foreword is just, or, or, well, the, the, the guys wrote a foreword and then the first chapter is you breezing through the whole story from like 10,000 feet. So you get a sense of just how crazy your life has been. And then each chapter takes you through the steps and uses stories from your past to illustrate how you work the step, which I thought was a really cool kind of narrative technique. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I guess it's more relatable for people. It's not too long. It's under 200 pages. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It's a good yarn, dude. And nobody loves a good addiction recovery yarn more than this guy. Oh, so thanks, well man. done, my friend. And it's exciting that it's going to be out in the world and such a, uh, an amazing arc given where you came from to where you are now. And I thought it would be cool to just format this conversation around what we know best, which is what it, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. We can kind of do it like a meeting, you know? So okay. <laughs> take us back and like paint the crazy picture of growing up in this small town in Ireland and how it kind of all went insane. Yeah, so I'm, you know, born and raised in Ireland. I came to America in my early twenties and where I'm from, it's like middle of nowhere, you know, countryside. And uh, when I was a kid, I was like, I was really shy and, and quiet, you know, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence and, you know, um, where I grew up was like a tough place, you know, like, uh, if you compare it to America, like when I was growing up, men where I'm from don't drink cocktails, you know, men don't drink cocktails, men don't really use umbrellas, <laughs> like yeah. it rains a lot in Ireland and, and you might see like a doctor or, or a teacher maybe carrying an umbrella but it's pissing rain all the time everybody's just standing out in it and yeah i started smoking when i was like a teenager and uh cigarettes were a bit harsh on my on my throat so i i saw these menthols so i started smoking menthols at the start you know and somebody saw me smoking menthols and they says are you fucking pregnant <laughs> you know <laughs> like that's the kind of spot it was right. when i was growing up so it's the town is called Cavan, how do you pronounce it? Cavan's Cavan, the, the county, C A V A N, Cavan. And what's interesting about that, I actually like went to Google Maps and pulled down pictures because I wanted to get a visual sense of, of what that place was like. And not a lot going on. A lot of pictures of like a church, it's kind of it. But you grew up close to the border of Northern Ireland. So you have this spillover of, of, of uh, Protestants, right? So you have Protestant, the Protestant Catholic kind of mm -hmm. tension that was going on that I'm sure kind of underscored, uh, you know, just the whole vibe of growing up there. Yeah, like, uh, so where I, where I grew up is at the border. So the border of Northern Ireland, um, there was a lot of like, uh, I guess terrorists around there, you know, because it's at the border and, uh, I'm Catholic, you know, I was raised Catholic, but my dad was a Protestant. Mm -hmm. So I have a Protestant name. Like in Ireland, if if you're a Catholic, you'll have a name like O'Reilly or McDonald or something like that. But if if you're Protestant, you have like a British sounding name. So my name's Richie Stevens. So like I sound like I'm Protestant. And then I was sent to like a Catholic school and uh wasn't a whole lot of fun, <laughs> as yeah. you could imagine. Like like in Ireland, maybe when I was growing up where I'm from, maybe 90% of people were Catholic, 10% were Protestant. Well, my mother was like devout Catholic, mm -hmm. so we were all sent to Catholic schools, but uh, I hated it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Like, you know, um, a lot of people kind of romanticized the, the uh, IRA, you know, the terrorist group over there. And, um, you know, I, I got dogs abused in the school because, you know, <laughs> Right. Even though you were in Catholic school and were raised Catholic, you had this Protestant last name. So exactly. it, it puts like a target on your back. Exactly. Yeah. Down. Yeah. And I was, you know, I used to let myself get pushed around and um, I used to always worry about things. It was like, uh, I was very, very self-conscious all the time. Like, mm -hmm. like where I'm from, it's really important to play like football, Gaelic football. And uh, that's all really people care about in the area. So it's like, if you go to a bar with your parents and you meet somebody, the first thing they say is, does this man play football? 
and it, you could be a fucking brain surgeon and if you didn't play football you were no good like yeah. you know so I played football but I was no good at it I had yeah. zero talent for it no matter how hard I tried but it's kind of like if you didn't tog out that's what they call it like just show up you were no good like so I played football but I was never any good at it you know every every time I would play a game if I get the ball I would be like but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd be so self-conscious. I wouldn't even know what to do. Like, and I would just get nailed all the time by yeah. the other players. And, you know, I tried to fit in as best as I could. But what really did it for me was the drinking. You know, uh, I started off, I went to a concert one time. Like I was about 14 or 15. I went to this concert over on the West Coast. It was Beastie Boys, Garbage, all these kind of bands. And. A girl on the bus on the way home gave me gave me a beer to see if I if, if I wanted a drink like and uh, I was okay. I tried this drink and then I was like it was like wow it's like lights did, went on. I didn't care what anybody thought about me. Uh, I had zero fear about anything. I was like this is like the special sauce that I want to I want to drink all yeah, the yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah, I mean, I, I really related to that. Um, sense of internal turmoil that you experienced as a young person, just feeling like out of place all the time, not comfortable in your own skin, uh, that, that, that sense of self-consciousness and kind of free-flowing anxiety. And what was interesting, what I didn't know, um, was that you grew up like a pretty good kid. Like the, the book's called The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, but it's not like you grew up in a notorious Irish crime family. No. Like you grew up with parents who cared for you and you know your needs were met and you were kind of a shy introverted kid um so all the insanity you know doesn't doesn't spawn from no, like a completely no, I can't. dysfunctional family situation yeah i can't blame that on anybody yeah. like you know i have a brother and sister who are normal like and as far as i know like nobody in my family has ever been in trouble with the law before so right. i'm like the black sheep but it, it was weird because some people can just have a few drinks and nothing happens. And then there's just certain people who just, the rule book goes mm -hmm. out the window. And I was that kind of a person, you know, and that that's how it affected me. Right. And in I, I would suspect like in the area in which you grew up, there wasn't a real appreciation for the disease of alcoholism. Right? No, it's just no. like people <laughs> drink, that's what happens. Yeah, you get out of control once in a while, but that ain't nothing but a thing. Yeah, like where I'm from, it's like a sign of masculinity to be able to drink a lot. Uh, you know, like where I'm from, they'll say, oh, that guy's a warrior for the drink, you know? And um, so so if you can't handle your drink, that's that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. But um, my definition of what an alcoholic was, was somebody who's homeless, can't hold down a job, you know, maybe they're smelly. You know, like, like that's yeah. what I thought an alcoholic actually was. So I had a problem with the sauce from very young, but I never really made the connection until I was a lot older because I, I know now that I was like a, a functional, quote unquote, yeah. alcoholic, if you could call it and functional. And very industrious yeah, and I, entrepreneurial. Yeah, in my own head, I was, keep, yeah, I was keeping <laughs> yeah. the show on the road. Like, yeah. Yeah, but it, 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 it did something for me that, that uh, I didn't have beforehand mm -hmm. you know it kind of uh it was my solution yeah to how i felt so you have that epiphany uh on the bus ride coming back from the concert having the drink because the pretty girl asked you to you have this sense like oh this is the solution to the problem i didn't even know that i had so where does it go from there for me like just in reading the book and knowing you it was, it was it's pretty incremental like that, that's a very innocent kind of introduction to alcohol that, that probably is extremely common. Like a lot of people have a, a, their version of that. Um, but that relationship uh, to alcohol and what it meant to you at that time sets in motion a chain of events that just spiral crazy out of control. Yeah, it didn't happen overnight, uh, the craziness. It was kind of, the problem was with me, there was no predicting how, how it would end up like sometimes i could have a few scoops and uh and and score with a woman and and go home and everything was fine and then there's other times i would black out wake up on the floor of someone's living room you know there was no predicting mm -hmm. you know but uh but i didn't care like for for me it was worth it, mm -hmm. it the, uh for the for the ease that and comfort that i got out of it it was really worth it and the, like the way it works in Ireland, if you're, it's 18 to drink in a bar or a club, right? And uh, 
I was 15, maybe 14 or 15 when I started drinking. And I wanted to drink with the grown-ups. Like, I wanted to go to clubs and bars. But the problem was, you need an ID. Because I still look pretty young. I have a mm-hmm. baby face. like, And um, so I decided to start making fake IDs. And first, I just made one for myself and, and, uh, and a couple of my friends. And it was great. It worked. I could go to all the bars and, you know, all the other kids heard that I had a fake ID. So a few people asked me to make them and they said they'd pay me. And that's how it started. I had this buddy. Uh, he was a year older than me in school. Uh, we'll call him Walter for the <laughs> for the sake of the story. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you anonymized all these I people. had to, yeah, yeah. The lawyers made me, you know. Well, some people are dangerous. You don't want to. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. don't want to, you know, tell fade, but, but, uh, so yeah, Walter, uh, he came up with the idea. He said, why don't you make the IDs and I'll sell them and we'll have a business and we can make a bunch of money. And, and, uh, I said, okay. And the way it, I, first I started making IDs for all the people in my school and then I was making them for people in other schools who I never met before. Uh-huh. I had like what a, were you charging for an ID? It was really cheap. Cheap. Yeah. It was like five bucks. Should like, charge more. Yeah, I know, but I, <laughs> I, I, I was a, I was only doing it for some drinking money. I wasn't trying to become right. a kingpin or something like that. But uh, yeah, uh, it just got out of control. And but it was great because like I would go everywhere around the You're county. Popular. Yeah, it was popular. You go from being this kind of quiet kid to suddenly being the guy that is in high demand. Yeah, yeah, it was it it, it was fun, and and I had all this like I was broke, so I I got all this drinking money from it, and uh, I could go to different bars and clubs, and people would like I'd already shown them my ID before, mm-hmm. so they knew my name and what I drank and all this kind of stuff. It was, and I was just a kid. Right. Like, be, What's great though is that you get busted for this racket you get charged with like a uh, offense of the state or something like that because of the, the, the official seal or something like that, that you figured out how to create yeah. uh, in a unique way that like freaked out the authorities. Well, basically the way IDs worked in Ireland back then, you get what's a police ID or in Ireland it's called the Garda. So you have a guard ID. So I was copying the guard ID because it was an official, an official ID. But back then it was like, it, it was easy to make one. It was kind of like, um, it was like uh, a card, a blue card, and then typewriter would have your name and your date of birth. And then in the back, there was a stamp. It was like a police stamp. And I, I was able to forge the stamp <laughs> in order, you know, that, right. was, that was tricky enough. And uh-huh. But what happened was Walter got caught and, and uh, he rolled over on me. And, you know, I found out about it. I was out of the house one day and I came home and, and my mother says, the police were looking for you. I was like, fuck, what happened? <laughs> she, was, she goes, that friend of yours fucking told, told the police you were making the IDs. So I was like, <laughs> oh, God. Like, and my, and uh, so, so I had to go in and like talk to the police, make, you know, have a, an interview. And it was nerve wracking. You know, they thought I had either stolen a stamp from the, the police station or maybe there was some kind of a mole or something. You know, mm-hmm. they didn't know how I had how I was doing it. So I had to go in and explain to them that the way I make these is I just make the stamp on my computer. I print it onto like an old photograph, you know, like a, a glossy photograph, mm-hmm. like an inkjet printer. If you print onto a photograph and if it's glossy, it'll stay wet. Yeah, it and doesn't you, dry. Yeah. So yeah. basically I would print it onto an old photo and then stamp it onto the card. And and then it looks like a stamp. But you had to print it in reverse, right? Yeah, I had to print it in reverse because yeah, yeah. if you do that, it comes up uh, backwards. Right. <laughs> so eventually I figured this shit out and I was trying to explain it to the cops. And like they were, in, I was like a 15, 16 year old kid and they're were, they were listening. They're like, Jesus, huh? Jesus. You know, because they must have thought I was some kind of a criminal genius. Right. But right. Uh, yeah, they were like, they were like, these are very serious charges because that's like what they charge terrorists with. Because mm-hmm. terrorists in Ireland, they they make fake documents and stuff like that. And and my friend Walter, uh, his family were uh, known to be terrorists mm-hmm. as well. So the fact that I was working with him was kind of, uh, they had, well, they wanted to get to the bottom of it. And in the end, I just, I just pretended I only met a couple of them. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I only met a couple from my friends. I won't do it again. And I hadn't been in trouble before, so, so they right. led me away with it. And I right. got away. So, so a couple observations on that. First of all, this is your first brush with the law. And also, 
you know, the, the first kind of like true resentment with a friend, cause this guy, Walter sold you out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's where, you know, the anger kind of enters the picture. Right. And anger plays a, a much bigger role as you, you know, walk this path. Um, but I'm curious about like where you think, like, what is the genesis of that anger? Like you, you know, like you would have these crazy outbursts and you get in all these fights later on and stuff like that. Um, like, what is that about and how have you kind of made peace with that or resolved it? Well, I think originally because I used to get pushed around in school, like, because my old man was a Protestant, like, so in Ireland where I'm from, uh, like a derogatory thing that they'll say to somebody who's, who's Protestant, they'll say, you're a black cunt, you know, not black as in the color mm -hmm. of your skin, but back in the old days, like in the 19 teens or, or whatever after, after world war one there were these uh, british soldier black group called tan. the black and tans and they came to ireland and they, they massacred a bunch of people and stuff like that so so when they're calling you black they're calling you one of those black and tans like mm -hmm. so i was pushed around at school uh, because of that kind of stuff so so i think when i was when i was little and i had no confidence or no courage uh it, it you know that affected me and then after i started drinking and i had this psychological change made me a different person then i was like determined not to take any shit from anybody because of how i had been treated when i was younger you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so i think i probably had a little bit of it it took it took a while for that to grow you know like uh, even when i first started drinking i don't know what it's like now but when i was growing up back home ireland was like violent you know not a lot of people getting murdered but when you go out drinking Everybody used to drink a lot. And then at the end of the night, we would go to these fast food restaurants. They called them chippers back home because they, they sell fries, like yeah. fish and chips, you know. And uh, after the night of drinking, everybody goes to the chipper. And that's when you would see the fights, you know, because it's like sports, like a spectator sport. Though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I used to sit in the chipper and watch these fucking boys uh, throwing each other beating each other it was it was mayhem mm -hmm. and when i was like when i first came to america i was only 160 pounds i was light you know so back then i was like a skinny light kid but i'm like taking all this shit in and it was it was kind of it was really exciting it was like an action movie in front of you yeah you know and and it, it was funny sometimes it was like um sometimes it would be over nothing like like Say you're in the chipper and and there's a guy there with his woman and and a, and a drunk guy like gives her the eye. He could get knocked out for that, you know, yeah. or spill some chips on somebody. You'd see you'd see them flying over tables. It yeah. reminds me of that scene in uh, The Gentleman. You see that movie where Colin <laughs> Farrell beats the shit out of a bunch of kids in, in, <laughs> in a chi in a chipper. You know that idea. Yeah, that could happen yeah. anytime. But but uh, and when I first started going out. I used to work at a gas station. It, back in the day, there was people called gas station attendants who would come and fill your gas for you. Like now yeah. everybody just, uh, everybody fills their own gas. But that was my first job. I was like 15 or 16 and I was working with these older boys. And one of them, I, sh I probably shouldn't say his name, his nickname is Tits because uh, he, he had man boobs, you know. But uh, Tits used to bring me out and, and uh, I used to look up to him, you know. He, uh, he was one of these guys... When I first met him, he had been arrested like 30 times just for like fighting or stupid drunk shit. And, and he never went to jail because when I was growing up, there was like there was no real penalties for that. Like mm. in like in California, I couldn't believe when I got here, there's not a whole lot of fights because if you like just put your hand on someone or spit on them, you're going to jail. Mm -hmm. But back home, you could kick the shit out of someone. And, and maybe if, if, you, if the cops got you, you might have to go to court and pay a couple of hundred dollars fine. That's all it was. There was like a boys will be boys mentality to the law. I don't know. Is it still like that there? I don't know. It, it, yeah. it might not be, but when I was growing up, that's how it was. Right. And, and I used to hang out with tits and he'd bring me out and, and you know, he, 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 <laughs> he was kind of a role model for me. Yeah. You know? What, what is the 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 truth or the lived experience of of growing up around I, the IRA because I you know my relationship to that is just what I've read in books or seen in movies. Well, you know what I'll tell you. I'll tell you the main thing that Hollywood never gets right about the IRA. Like whenever you see the movies or anything like that about about um, 
about the IRA, they they make it out like it's this really fucking secret thing where these guys come out of nowhere and nobody knows who they are. But in real life, you know exactly who's in the IRA. Because mm-hmm. in Ireland, like, it's a small country. Everybody knows everybody. So if if your neighbor is in the IRA, you know. Like, if, if their kid is is on the, the team with you, everybody knows because they have marches and shit and you see them at the marches or they might come to the bar to collect money for, for whatever, the prisoners or whatever the fuck they're, they're collecting money for. So in real life, everybody knows exactly who's in the IRA. So so there's there's no secret, you know, but, but it's still... And you just sort of tiptoe around it and tread lightly? It depends. I have a load of friends who are in it and uh-huh. whose, fa- who, who, whose families are in it, you know. It, 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 the way it is as well, it's like a volunteer sort of a thing. So they're called volunteers. So right. some people join up for a while and then they go away again. And that's how it is. Like, right. You know, but I always ended up with being friends with a bunch of their kids because there were a lot of them were kind of wild like I was, uh-huh. you know. Yeah, wow. So, so the drinking starts to escalate. Uh, hash enters the picture. At some point, you start kind of selling, dealing a little bit. Like, walk me through that next It was phase. the exact same shit as the, as the drinking. With the drinking, I started selling IDs to fund my drinking. And then with the hash, I started, like, I, f- I started smoking hash when I was maybe 16 or 17 too. And because it, it was, I knew it couldn't kill you. And, and it looked cool, you know. And I had seen it on TV and movies and stuff like that. And so I wanted to try it. And I met these guys one night in Cavan. Um, can't really use their names. Let's call them. <laughs> we'll, this guy has a really obvious name. We'll call him Pigeon, right? All right, there so you I go. I met Pigeon and, uh, and his buddy one night. He goes, you want to buy some hash? Hi. They have all this funny way of talking. You think my way is funny. Uh-huh. They have all this weird lingo, like where I'm from. They say, hi, Sham, or hi, Sobla. He say, hi, Sham, you want to buy some hash? Hi. They say hi about everything weird so i says yeah how much is it he goes i'll give you five spot it was five pounds at the time now we have euros but back then we mm-hmm. had pounds so he like saw me this little ball of hash and it was in a matchbox and uh he said Do you know how to smoke it i said uh no and he he rolled me a joint and we smoked it together and it was like it was like discovering alcohol all over again except not so crazy it was more chilled like there was no you wouldn't fall down on hash, really. You probably couldn't crash a car on it, mm-hmm. you know. But but uh, I, I once I discovered the hash too, it was something that I I wanted to do all the time, even though I knew it was illegal. I had to be careful not to get caught. But uh, yeah, I started to sell it to 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 fund my 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 use of it. Yeah, and what's going on at home at this time? Like, what's mom? Oh, I kept it quiet from from the parents, you know, like. Uh, I, I led a double life, really, yeah. with my folks and even with my wife and everything down through the years. I would do a lot of secret shit. You know, I would I would stay over with friends and, you know, sometimes I would come home and my poor mother would be like sitting in the kitchen at four o'clock in the, in the morning waiting for me. And I'd walk in the door drunk and, you know, I felt bad about it, but I still, I still felt like it was worth it mm. at the time. Well, it's also that thing where you think you're getting away with this, that double life that they're not aware of what you're doing, but it's pretty transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is what it is. Like, uh, yeah, I put, I put my poor parents through a lot, like, you know, because later when I got into trouble, everybody around knows everybody and stuff like that. So when I got into trouble later, I got caught dealing, uh, everybody knew. You know. Right. I mean, how are they now? What do they think about this book and this potential <laughs> TV show and all of that? It uh, must be a mind blower. Well, back. It, have you, you probably haven't been, have you been back home at oh, all? Oh yeah, I've been home a lot of times. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure th- they don't like the stuff being brought up, but it is what it is. It's, it's a positive story. I, I turned my life around. It's not like I'm still doing this, th- this kind of stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah, but just the idea that like there's a book out there and you're kind of being feted, celebrated. Yeah, well, you know, my mother like said to me, she goes, "Jesus Christ, you're not you're not worried about people knowing what you did," uh-huh. and I'm like, "If I gave a fuck, I wouldn't have wrote it in a book." Like, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, but um, that's only natural, I suppose. But that's that shame thing, right? That mm-hmm. kind of emanates out of Catholicism. 
Like yeah. we keep our we keep our, our our weaknesses private. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when I was a kid, I was like, I was super into the Catholicism. Like mm. um, even though I didn't like being forced to go to church every week. I was an altar boy at the at the church and and uh that shit used to make me nervous as well because you gotta stand sit up in front of everybody at the front of the church and you know, if you're an altar boy, you have to like ring the bell at certain times during the thing. And I would always be so nervous about that shit as well. I'd either miss the fucking time I was supposed to do it or ring it too early or it was fucking mortifying. You know, <laughs> same yeah. shit with the water and the wine. You bring over the water and the wine to the priest at a certain time. And I was always fucking that up, you know? Well, when you get sober though, and you're you're kind of confronted with the idea of embracing a higher power. Catholicism didn't exactly, you, you know, strike you as a as a as a good option at the time. No, by the time I got like sober, there's a soured relationship. Yeah, well, it, just God in general. When I got sober, I was a complete atheist. I didn't believe there could be God. Like, uh, like I just the way I saw it was, God is like something that people believe in when they're children, like Santa Claus, you know, and all these bad things had happened to me and uh, I just d didn't believe that there could be a God, you know, and that's, that's the way I felt um, before I got sober. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Prophets Walk Among Us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume 2. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on The Ritual Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. All right, so let's pick, pick the story back up. Like you're starting to deal a little bit. You want to go to college, you're, you kind of <clears throat> put the foot on the gas on the dealing. Ecstasy enters the picture. Like let's, you know, it, it, this, this hurricane is starting to pick up speed. Yeah, so I got to college and by the time I got to college, I was, um, I was a regular hash smoker and a regular drinker. And, uh, you know, I wasn't afraid to fight or I wasn't afraid to score with the women. And I was just, I was dealing a little bit of hash. And, and, and then I met my friend Tomo. So Tomo kind of changed everything. Uh, I was introduced to him by my friend Ferret. And and uh, <laughs> he was he was called Ferret because he talks really fast. He sounds like a ferret, but uh, yeah. So Ferret introduced me to Tomo, and he was a real character. He was always talking about where he's from. Apparently, he used to deal a lot of ecstasy. Kind of people talk a lot of shit. So I was always I was always skeptical, you know. And uh, we used to hang out with Tomo. He'd be telling us about these tall tales about how he was dealing ecstasy in his hometown and all this mm -hmm. kind of shit. And one night, uh, we were all drinking around Halloween. We were over at my place. We were drinking a load of beer and smoking hash. And we decided to go for a walk around the neighborhood. And there was a, there was a house party going on. And uh, so we walked up to the house party. It was like four or five of us. It was me, Ferret, Pat the Rat, and, uh, and Tomo. 
He was called Pat the Rat because he kind of looks like a rat. Uh-huh. He, he wasn't, wasn't a snitch. Also, <laughs> lots of Pats, right? So yeah. every Pat had to have like an appendage. Yeah, if you're him. Irish, you'll know yeah. a lot of Pats, a lot of PJs, all that. So, so a lot of boys that I knock around would have nicknames. So we saw this house party going on. And we walked up and we, we rang the doorbell. Some dude answered the door. And we're like, oh, can we come into your par- party? And they were like, uh, they were like, no, no, we don't know you. You can't come in. So like, fuck. And uh, then they closed the door on us, went back to the house and we're drinking again. We said, fuck those pricks, wouldn't let us into the party. Like, And Tomo had like a bottle of wine there. And he goes, he goes, mush, do you dare me to come back and put this through the fucking window? <laughs> we were, we were, we were, oh, it's always full of shit. He's never going to do that. And uh, we're like, yeah, we dare you, do it. So we walked back around the block again and Tomo got the fucking wine bottle fucked it through the window like straight through the window of the fucking house like we were like wow Tom was fucking crazy he actually did it like we all ran away like you know and then uh, and then after that I was like wow Tom was the real deal he's, he's this guy isn't a bullshitter or anything you know and then so me and Tom were out one night there's a bar called the LA Leinster Arms we were in the Leinster Arms and I knew Tom did ecstasy but I was afraid to do ecstasy because I thought, you know, in the news, you read these stories about how people took ecstasy one time and they fucking died. Like, And then I, w- I always thought, like, I'm kind of unlucky. So it, that would probably be me if I took the ecstasy one time. So Tits used to do it, my old friend from Cavan. But I used to hang out with him while he was on ecstasy. But but uh, I was always scared to do it because I mm-hmm. thought I would be that un- unlucky person that it kills and then one night we were out in the LA, me and Tomo, and uh, and he goes, Mush, do you want to try one of these ecstasy? And I was like, uh, well, I don't know. I, I fucking, I'm afraid it might kill me, you know? He goes, Mush, these are light ones. They're, they're, they're really light. They're not strong. You'll be grand. So he handed me this double, this beige pill with 007 on it. And I saw this pill. And uh, he, he goes, go on, take one to fuck. Go into the bathroom, take it. So... Went into the bathroom. I was really scared. It had this fucking 007 pill in my hand. And I was thinking, hmm, Tom was smart. And if they haven't killed him, maybe, maybe I'd be okay with it, uh-huh. you know? So I said, fuck it. A half wouldn't kill somebody. A quarter definitely wouldn't. So I took, I, I broke it in half. And then I broke it in half again. And I took a quarter <laughs> and I put the, the other three quarters back into my pocket. And I came back outside. And Tomo goes, did you take it? And I was like, yeah. He goes, all right, let me know when you're coming up. And then coming up means it's starting to take effect. Mm-hmm. So maybe half hour later or three quarters of an hour later, I'm not feeling anything. Tomo says, are you coming up yet? I was like, oh, no. He goes, did you take it all? I was like, uh, I only took a half. And he goes, Mush, take a whole one. These are really light. You got to take a whole one. So I went back in, took another quarter. Went back in, took another quarter. And then... Uh, Eventually, it started coming up, and ecstasy was like nothing I had ever tried before. It was, it's called ecstasy for that reason. It mm-hmm. actually feels like ecstasy. I came out, and, and I was like, I loved everybody in the fucking place. You know, I had no bad feelings. It was overwhelming, like, and, uh, and I was just thinking, fuck, why doesn't everybody on earth take these all the time? You know, I was yeah. thinking there would be no wars or anything. This is fucking great. <laughs> and and that that night I ended up, uh, like I would be all sweaty and my jaw would be hanging and my foot would be tapping and music sounded good. And, and I ended up taking two on my first night. And it was kind of like, <laughs> it was like discovering alcohol all over again, except a uh-huh. hundred times better. And I loved it. And then, Ecstasy costs money as well. <laughs> so there was the financial problem of paying for the ecstasy. And I was the first one out of my friends to start taking it. And then Pat the Rat started taking it and the other boys as well. And so Tomo was kind of, he was, I, I was sort of friendly, right? Mm-hmm. Tomo was kind of quiet and antisocial. So not a lot of people knew him. So I was kind of like, all my friends started taking them after me and we were all doing them together. A lot of people were telling me to, to get pills off them from Tomo. And uh, so I was ending, ending up getting 10 or 15 a night for everybody and just, just getting them as a favor. And Tomo says to me, he goes, Mush, 
why don't you take a hundred of these and you can sell some of them and then you get you get you get a bunch of money and you get to do your own for free. And uh I was like, oh no, no, that's dealing. That's serious. If the cops catch you dealing, it wouldn't be like the IDs. I'd fucking go to jail for that shit for years. Like and he goes, Mush, you're already dealing them. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm I'm getting them as favors. And he says, Mush, if the cops catch you, the charge is for sale or supply. You're supplying them, so you're already dealing them for free. Mm-hmm. I was like, fuck, he's right. Might as well get it. Yeah, paid. I was like, fuck, I'm already dealing them for free. You might as well. And it made sense. And Tom was smart. So I was like, okay. And then I, I just by default, just like that, I became an ecstasy dealer because I ended up getting them from my friends. And then Tom started like training me how to do it. Like, you know, it's, you know, Say if you're a parent out there and and uh, you're wondering how does your kid get involved in drugs, like someone has to show them, mm-hmm. you know, at least the ins and outs of how to do it. I'd get like bags of a hundred and and uh, he like, you know, he'd he'd tell me how much to charge and not to give people credit and you know all the ins and outs of it, how to watch right. out for the cops, all this kind of stuff, and it, just like that, it just seemed to happen. In a short period of time, I was supplying the whole college with, mm. you know? Yeah. All of your dealing over the years, though, through San Francisco seems to be purely motivated on your part just to have a little extra cash and to be able to have an infinite supply for yourself, right? I yeah. mean, you weren't trying to be some kind of gangster kingpin in terms of dealing. You just wanted to make sure that you always had access to to the drugs that you wanted. Pretty much, especially at the beginning. But then later I started, it started to get way more serious in terms of like, you know, doing bigger things. And, and, uh, but at the beginning, that's all it was, you know? Um, but, but the problem was, so at the beginning, ecstasy was great. There, there wasn't even much of a come down. You'd be awake all night and the come down wasn't too bad at the beginning. But what happens when you're doing ecstasy, probably the same as everything. The more of it you do, the more of it you need to do. So mm-hmm. like one or two pills used to do me for a night at the beginning. And then later I wouldn't even come up unless I double dropped. Like, like, and in Ireland they were cheap. Like back then they were about 10 pounds a piece for one pill. And I was getting them for three or four pounds a piece in bulk. So when they're cheaply available and, and when they're not working as good, you just end up just taking yeah. more and more and more. You know, and and uh, and that's what happened to me. The tolerance went up, and but then the come down, you get the that come down got worse too. That, yeah, yeah, the highs were very very high, and the lows were really really low. And uh, you know, I, I started dating this girl. Uh, uh, we'll call her Tabitha. I was madly in love with her. Like before, I started doing ecstasy. I I don't think I could even experience the emotion of love. I was like really really closed off and stuff like that. But when I started doing ecstasy, it was like. You know, it, uh, I think it it did something to my personality that wasn't there before, and uh, and I was madly in love with this chick, and we we were we were uh, going out for a while, and it, it, she would always end up getting me into fights with people. I remember one time, uh, I was staying at her house one night. Her bedroom was on the second floor, and uh, I was sound asleep in bed. I'd say it was about one o'clock in the morning, and I wake up and she's screaming, Richie, Richie, Richie. I fucking wake up, right? And the the window is right beside the bed. Mm -hmm. And it's up on the second floor. There was a fucking man at the window. And she was screaming, Reggie, Reggie. I was like, this guy was trying to get into the house. It was was a wooden window that opens out. I'm telling you, I opened the window and I beat the fucking shit out of him with the window. I, I beat the crap out of him with the window. And he didn't fall off the roof, but he got down and ran away. And then I woke up and I and I saw uh, Tabitha and she had she had her boobs out like you know and then I kind of realized she must have been flashing the dude outside the window while I was asleep and the guy fucking climbed up on the roof to try and get into bed with her <laughs> and I get woken up and I'm beating this guy with a fucking window you know second floor I mean if he had yeah. fallen and cracked his head yeah and then the next day now this would only happen in Ireland this would never happen in America the next day I'm sitting in the living room with her and her roommate, and the doorbell rings, and it's the guy from last night. And uh, I looked out the window, and I saw him, and his, the poor guy, I gave him a bad old beating with the window, like I probably hit him about 20 times, where his face was all swollen and cut. 
But I thought he was coming back to, to get me. So I, I grabbed the fire, like the poker out of the fireplace and, and came out like, and, but she answered the door. But the guy just came to apologize. He, he like, I guess he sobered up and realized <laughs> what happened. This would only happen in, in oh Ireland. Like God. the guy came to Can apologize. You in LA? That would never happen in America, no. you know, but the dude had come back to apologize and she answered the door and she saw his face and I'm behind her with the poker. I was going to fight him with the poker because I didn't know what was happening. And she was trying to invite him in for a cup of tea because she felt bad. And all he oh wanted to do God. was apologize and hope that she wasn't going to call the police, you know. Well, now I know why John and Dave want to make a TV show out of this. Because <laughs> the thing about the book and these stories as, as sort of, you know, horrid and awful as, as some of this stuff is, like there's this undercurrent of hilarity. Like there's, there's a lot of comic relief in oh, all yeah, of this. Yeah, you I have mean, to have a dark Without making you. excuses for your violent behavior and obviously people were hurt and all of that. <clears throat> like just I'm imagining in my mind, like what that must have looked like. Like it's very cinematic. Yeah, I don't think that one even made it into the book. But but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, but but but, uh, <laughs> but I think the thing too, like to go back to something you said a few minutes ago, you said that you couldn't access that feeling of love until you took ecstasy, and I think it's an important point to make that you make in the book, which is like these things work, man. And when you're an addict or an alcoholic, something does get unlocked. Like it is serving a purpose, mm -hmm. and I think in terms of um, talking openly about the nature of addiction and recovery, it's important to acknowledge like that fact, like they serve a purpose. And in recovery, when you look back and kind of regale in these stories to acknowledge like I needed that and actually it did something for me and it worked until obviously it stopped working and then it became very dark and yeah. terrible, but there is that piece there that I think if you're be you know, that, that it's important to be honest about that. Yeah. I'll be real about everything. You know, uh, obviously it's, it's, some of the stuff is very embarrassing, but like, if you can't be honest, like what's the point, you mm -hmm. know, that's the way I see it. But basically anyway, I was madly in love with this girl and we ended up breaking up and I, I was, I was, I was pretty, pretty down about it. And by that stage I was probably doing ecstasy three or four times a week. Uh, I was averaging 15 or 20 pills in a night. So I was like wow. all over the place. The head wasn't working right. And, uh, I, and you know, I was feeling really down. It was around the time of 9-11. And, uh, and I, remember, I, I remember one day I decided to get two bottles of Jack Daniels. I, I, I was just kind of drowning my sorrows, you know. So I brought them to the house and I was like, I was uh, drinking these uh, bottles of JD and and then, you know, I, end, I, I, my, I got more and more depressed and I said, fuck it, I'll just kill myself, you know? And, and uh, I, I had a hundred ecstasy. I started with a handful of five. So I started just drink, like drinking and swallowing the ecstasy. Started putting out cigarettes on my arm. I still have mm -hmm. these scars on my arm from where I was do doing that. And got a knife and started cutting my hand. It was like, I, I barely even remember it, but what happened was I took about 30 pills and uh, one of my roommates, this guy called uh, Travis, we'll call him, uh, Travis, Travis hid the rest of my pills and saved my life. Like, and uh, I was like shitting myself and, and uh, I blacked out. Nobody brought me to the hospital, would you believe? Yeah. And, uh, but I survived. Like, you know, it was crazy. That was like my first suicide attempt. I'd say I was about 19 years old. But uh, yeah, like down through the years, I'd say I probably, before I got sober, like I'd say I probably, I lost count of the number of times I tried to kill myself. And mm -hmm. like that one was pretty pathetic, but some of them were kind of funny if you mm -hmm. have a dark sense of humor. Like uh, I remember one time around 2008, 2009, a life insurance policy, right? In case something happened to me, the, the missus and the kids mm -hmm. would be okay, you know? And I used, I used, to, uh, used to party with my life insurance agents agent this guy called chris and uh anyway i was i was on the tear drinking loads and doing loads of drugs and and i decided fuck it i'll just kill myself and uh, and I, but i was like oh what if if i kill myself will that nullify the fucking policy for for the life insurance <laughs> so uh so yeah. I, i'm outside my house <laughs> smoking cigarettes like planning my death and uh, i ring up chris he's like hey richie what's going on i was like hey chris 
hey, if I kill myself, does that nullify the policy? <laughs> and he says, he says, yeah, you fucking idiot. It's fucking suicide. I'm like, shit, I don't want to fucking leave my fucking kids penniless. And, uh, and you know what he said to me that just snapped me out of it that night? He said, uh, he said, Richie, you're like a fucking fat kid who's crying because he can't eat his fucking cake. That's what he said to me. Mm. And for some reason, that just snapped me out of it. It was weird. I had, I had loads of in- incidents like that. Like another time, I'd say it was maybe around 2007, 2008. I used to be a carpenter. When I came to America, I, I, I learned how to be a carpenter. I was, I was a drug dealer, but also a carpenter. Mm-hmm. And uh, this buddy of mine, Dav, he, uh, he, he had a side job for me to do on the weekends. He says, he's, he calls me Fetch. So he says, hey, Fetch, do you want to do a side job at the weekend? I says, yeah, what is it? He says, it's at a fortune teller's up in Laguna Honda. You have to, you have to like, she wants to build a couple of walls or some shit. I was like, okay. But uh, the night before, I was on like a really bad bender. So I was, I was dying while I was working. And I was thinking about killing myself while I was working at this fortune teller's. You know, she was very nice. I was working away. I was putting down my plates, nailing them with a nail gun. And, and she's watching me while I'm working. And, and, uh, and I'm thinking, you know what? When I'm done here, I'll go to the fucking bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. Because uh, I'll, 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 a lot of people kill themselves in mm-hmm. the Golden Gate Bridge. So I'm, I'm nailing my plates and I'm thinking uh, I'll go to the bridge when I'm done. And, uh, and then I was thinking, fuck, you know, there's a net around the Golden Gate Bridge. So if you jump in the wrong place, you'll end up in the net. Mm. So I was thinking, fuck, knowing my luck, I'd probably end up in the fucking net, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm nailing my studs and, and she's watching me. And then I'm thinking, you know what, I'll just go down there to the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge and I'll blow me brains out. Nobody ever kills themselves with a gun on the Golden Gate mm. Bridge. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I'll do that, you know. And it, this is while I'm working, I'm debating with myself how I'm going to kill myself. And the fortune teller is watching me. And she, she looks at me and she goes, oh, my God, you have a wonderful aura. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was, I just, it was so ridiculous. I laughed out loud. I was thinking, you fucking fraud. I didn't say anything to her, but, but. The ridiculousness of what she said to me snapped me out of it for that day. Mm. It was so, so bizarre. Like I had so many of those moments. Yeah, little, like, uh, little interventions yeah. that you weren't even aware of. But amongst all of these efforts to end your life, did it ever enter your mind? Like maybe I should get off the drugs and alcohol. Like a normal person who's listening to this, like I, I understand where you're coming from, but a normal person is thinking, dude, it's the drugs and the alcohol, man. Just quit that shit. Well, you know, I knew I had a problem with the drugs and alcohol, but I didn't put two and two together about the depression being linked to the drugs and alcohol. Like, as I said, growing up, I, I, I had no idea of what alcoholism really is, you know. I just basically thought it was someone who couldn't handle their shit. I didn't realize that part of it is it can make a person so depressed that they want to end their life, you know. So I thought there were two separate issues. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, uh, until I got sober and I, I, I found out, oh, that's part of the deal, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, depression is part of the deal. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, like it crossed my mind. Um, but I, when I was younger, I, like in my early 20s, I was like, this is what people do in their 20s, right? Uh, and I, I, I kind of thought maybe I'll quit sometime in the future, mm-hmm. maybe like when I'm 30 you know, if I live that long, that's right. kind of what I thought. And what, Those what, goalposts keep moving. Exactly, up. yeah. I move the goalposts every time. And and what the funny thing was, a lot of times after a really bad bender, I'd be I'd be fucked for a day or two after it, and then during that day or two, I would kind of think maybe I need to quit this shit, okay? Or maybe if I pissed off the wife, or if I did something, or. Uh, maybe went missing or whatever I was doing, uh, I would make promises to her as well. Like, you know, because I wasn't fucking behaving like husband of the year or anything Mm -hmm. like that, you know? So I would make, and at times I would really mean it. I'd be like, okay, I'm never drinking again, never doing Coke again. And then after I would feel better, after whatever week, once I start to recover, I thought my mind was changing. Mm -hmm. For a lot of years, I thought I changed my mind. I wanted to quit last week, but I don't want to quit this week. And then my mind would change. And I thought that was me changing my mind. 
for a lot, a lot of years, I thought that was me that was changing my mind each time. But then eventually, after a lot of years, I was 28 when I got sober, eventually it became obvious to me that it wasn't me that was changing my mind. It was something else that I was fucking powerless over. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, you know, if you have a problem with the, the booze and the drugs, it's a very sneaky fucking mental condition because it'll tell you you don't have the problem, mm -hmm. you know? And I used to hang around with a lot of dudes who like, in my perception, were worse than I was because I could look at Eric or whoever I'm hanging out with and, and go, I'm not as bad as Eric, look at him, <laughs> you know? But it's a defense mechanism. Sure, it's a wise strategy though. Yeah. So that you it, don't really have to own your own shit. Yeah, but it happens even, it, it happens beyond your own consciousness. Yeah. It fucking works in the background, it's weird. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. You mentioned uh, Travis and Tomo. I want to talk about the kidnapping. <laughs> this is where shit gets serious. Oh, God. So, after a couple of years of uh, working with Tomo, working for Tomo, um, I could never seem to get ahead. I was always, always ended up owing him more money. He'd give me a hundred pills. And I would end up either taking most of them myself or giving them away and not being able to collect the money. And, and he, he, you know, he was throwing good money after bad. He would uh -huh. keep giving me more chances, giving yeah, me more This guy pills. seems in incredibly patient given yeah, the fact he was, that you were fairness. a terrible drug dealer. In fairness, yeah, he yeah. was, you know. <laughs> but uh, so I was, I was my own best customer. That was the problem. So I never got rich or anything like that. I was, I was a disaster. And so I ended up owing him a lot of money. And this guy, Travis, that I used to live with, he was, he was, we were only 19 or 20 at the time. We were only kids still, but this guy was in his thirties. He was a good dude. He was kind of a hippie, you know, uh, he was from down South in Cork and like a nice fella, he wore glasses, you know, harmless. Right. And, uh, Tomo was a wholesaler. I was like a street dealer that time and Tomo was a wholesaler. So he would, he would be given large amounts of drugs to different people. And this guy, Travis, he got a few kilos of hash on credit. And uh, so in Ireland, we say on tick, that means basically on credit. So he gets the couple of kilos and then just disappears, just stop answering his phone. There's no intention of paying it back, <laughs> you know? He, like, he wasn't telling Tomo to fuck off. He was mm -hmm. just saying, just, just ignoring him. And then, so Tomo had got that on credit from his supplier. We had a bigger supplier. We used to go to down in a place called Navin. We called this boy Smiling Pat because mm -hmm. he was always smiling, but he was, he was really dangerous. Um, anyway, Tomo's supplier, Pat, was getting impatient for the money. He's ringing up Tomo and, and, uh, putting power tools on the phone, like saws and shit like that, and saying, this is what you're going to get if you don't pay that fucking money for, for what you owe. 
So I owe money to Tomo, Travis owes money to Tomo, and Tomo owes money to Pat. So that's where the dilemma started. And at the time, Tomo had this roommate uh, up in Dublin, this guy called Mick. He was a British guy. Mick was like a, a shit bag. He, he, uh, he borrowed a load of coke off a bunch of different gangsters up in Dublin and they were shooting at Tomo in the street and everything like that. They tried to kill him over that. Like, so I was like, Tomo told me, I was like, what kind of a gun was it? You know, he goes, Mush, I didn't stop to look at it. They were firing shots at me in the fucking street, you know? Uh, so, so we're all, we're all in a lot of trouble. Right. And, uh, but I'm trying to pay Tomo back. I'm his friend. So he's not really mad at me, but he's getting upset. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, the word is that Travis, or Travis's parents have money. So Tomo says, okay, Mush, if you help us kidnap Travis, I'll write off your debt and we'll get his parents to pay the money that he owes. So I'm like, fuck, that's, that's really serious shit. I, and Travis had saved my life before. He wasn't a bad dude, mm -hmm. even though he, he owed the money. So I was like, if you guys are going to kill him, I'm not fucking helping you with that. He doesn't deserve to die, you know? So uh, he goes, no, much. swear to God, we won't kill him. And <laughs> Tomo, Tomo was actually Catholic enough. Like he really, if he swears to God, you believe him. Mm. You know, I did anyway. So, so he said, so Tomo lived in Dublin and I lived in outside Dublin in a different town. And Travis lived in my town. And he goes, Mush, as soon as you see him, fucking call me. I'll be down with the boys from Dublin. We'll take him to a safe house and make his parents pay the money. So my job was to like find them and let the boys know. So uh, one day I'm down in this bar called The Roost. It's like a, a busy fucking crowded place with like a DJ, you know, uh, kind of a college bar. Uh, so I'm down in The Roost one night and I see Tra I see Travis and I, I message Tomo. And uh, I, I, I said, he's here in The Roost. And uh Tomo rings me. He goes, Mush, stay on him. We'll be down from Dublin. Stay on him. Don't fucking lose him. Let me know if he moves, right? So I'm watching him. And then eventually he he moves to go to another bar. There's one up the street called Caulfields. It's like an old man's pub, like quiet fucking. There might be five people there mm -hmm. dead. Like, So I follow him up to up to Caulfields and I'm waiting there with Tomo. And he's just having a pint of Guinness by himself, just fucking enjoying himself. The place is empty and quiet. like, And... Uh, Next thing, Tomo arrives. He had a separate crew of boys from Dublin. Like, there was me and the other boys we hung around with who were young lads, but Tomo was like my age. He was only 19 or 20, but he had these older ex-cons who like followed him around up in Dublin and like he had a separate crew of boys from Dublin who were mm. like really dangerous fellas, you know? Like ex-cons, you know? They were probably in their 30s, I'd say, by that point. But uh, in he walks with the boys... Uh, with his crew from from Dublin and I'm standing there watching and Travis just looks up and he sees the boys fucking in front of his table and uh, and he, he, he looks at him and, and uh, he goes Mush come on you're coming with us up to Dublin and uh, he didn't he didn't fight he didn't kick or scream he just fucking got up he took it like a man right and but he knew out. the shit was real well yeah because he owed like thousands of pounds mm -hmm. at the time that was before the euro changeover so it would have been pounds we had pounds at the time it, actually when when we when we changed from pounds to euros Tomo had to change my debt from okay so you owe me a thousand pounds that's equal to 1256 euros <laughs> we had to like change over what was owed to fucking euros like but but yeah so the boys walked out with, with Travis like and then until until I seen them walking out with him, I felt I felt okay about it. You know, I was like, the guy owes the money, he's, we're doing the right thing. But then when I seen them walking out with him, I was like, fuck, he might not make it back alive. Like, you know, they mm -hmm. might and then I felt really bad about it. And, you know, he had saved my life before too. That time I was gonna kill myself. So I, f I felt terrible about it, you know. Right. Yeah. But uh it was it was out of my control. Like so then later I found out what happened off Tomo. Basically, they brought him to the safe house. The safe house was Tomo's own house in Dublin. They didn't yeah, have a no, fucking no safe. real safe house. They didn't really have a safe house. They brought him to his yeah. fucking house. Like, and uh, they brought him up there and, and they were trying to scare him. And Tomo's brother, uh, he's a really nice fella. He's a gay dude. Anyway, Tomo's brother comes in with like a tray full of tea to the boys while they're in the middle. Of, and Tomo's like, Mush, get out the fuck. You're ruining the mood. Like, yeah. you know, it, was, it sounded funny to me. Like, but 
first of all, Travis was saying, oh, my parents don't have any money, you know. And then eventually, uh, Tomo went out to the kitchen and he brought, he brought out some trash bags. And he says, Mush, you pay the fucking money or you're going in the fucking bin bags. And then at that, Travis rang the parents and they drove up with the money. Uh, I don't know what it was, five or six grand, I think, plus each of the kidnappers got 500 apiece plus whatever I owed. Like, so they came up with the cash and uh, Tomo told me uh, he, they were supposed to, they met in like a, a, a deserted parking lot, you know. Tomo came and he, he put one of those scarves around his around his face so mm -hmm. so he, so they couldn't see his face and Travis's mother had the money and 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 she said please don't hurt him and uh Tomo was like Mush, I don't know nothing about it I'm just here to pick up the money you know and uh she gave the money they let him go that was the end of it yeah so when it comes time for you to make amends for your role in this yeah. whole thing, it creates quite a dilemma for you. Yeah. But yeah. now you've written about it in a book, and even though you're using different names, these people have These are all no, real people, right. yeah. These, these are all real people, yeah. But um, yeah, it's not fair to use the real names. Yeah. So that's a that's a tricky one, right? Like, how do you make this wrong right? Yeah. Uh, later on, like, part of sobriety is when, when you're working the steps, you have to make amends to people you've hurt, like... And, when I was when I was doing my amends list, he was he was the top of my list. Like my sponsor was this guy called Bernard, and he says, "Well, show me your list." And uh, I took out the list, and the top of the list was kidnapped Travis. And uh, you know, for the amends, you're supposed to run it by your sponsor. So, you know, it might be something like money owed or whatever. So I, I would always try and excuse me figure out in my head ahead of time what the amends might be, you know, and, and uh, so I was thinking, what's the opposite of a kidnapping? I could send him on a lovely vacation. You know, that, that's what I was thinking in my head when I first got sober and I was talking to my sponsor about it. And, uh, and he, 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 I told him, I says, uh, do, you want me, do you want me to send him on a vacation? He says, does that man know you're involved in the kidnapping? I says, no. He says, well, don't fucking tell him. He says, it's probably the worst experience of the man's life. Just don't fucking kidnap anyone again. And and that was the that was the events. It was you just let me leave the guy alone. Just don't ever don't ever mm -hmm. do that kind of stuff again. But now at some point he might come across the book. Well, I'll, I'll make it this. So you might have me. to reopen that case. Yeah. Travis, if you're out there, let me know what I can do. Right. There might be a vacation coming your might way. Might be a vacation in yeah. your future. <laughs> yeah. Well, at some point you pull this geographic and move to San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking like, oh, if I just get out of Dodge, yeah. all will be rainbows. Yeah, make a long story very short. Uh, I thought that Ireland was the problem. Maybe if I got out of Ireland that that my fortunes would change, you know? And, and uh, I got married really young. My, my ex-wife was from San Francisco and that's, that's how I ended up moving there when I was 22, I became a dad. And, I tried to be good, really, at the start when I got there, and I was good for a few years, but uh, eventually things, <laughs> I, could, I couldn't yeah. keep myself. Well, you brought yourself with you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, on, the only thing that changed was the location. I didn't right. change. Right. I mean, there's so many stories and incidents that you have, uh, but the, the one thing that I do want to <laughs> hear from you about is how you got involved with this Asian gang. Hmm. I didn't even realize that was funny until I started wa working with John. You know, I told him I was in this Asian gang. He's like, you were in an Asian gang? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, but you're not Asian. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm not. He's like, well, what were you doing with the Asian Asian gang? I was like, well, they had the best cocaine. You know, uh, it, I, around, around recession time, there was no more work for a carpenter. And I was broke. And I had bad enough cocaine habit so i started dealing again because i couldn't afford to just be a user anymore and i started off getting this like crappy coke from this irish guy i knew this little irish guy his nickname was the pony so the pony was giving me this crappy coke for 800 bucks an ounce and it wasn't that strong and i don't know if you know anything about drug dealing it's way easier to sell stuff that's strong than not so I, I was selling this crappy Coke that I got off the pony. And uh, and I used to get my own Coke off these Asian guys. Mm -hmm. They were like 
organized crime, like professional dudes, and they had really, really strong coke. It was it was extra money per gram, but it was like pure, like uncut fish scale, the shiny rocky stuff, the good stuff. So I was getting my own stuff off them for for whatever a couple of years, and I I, can't, I was finding it hard to sell the shitty coke. And then I I came up with with the idea, why don't I ask these guys to buy the bulk off them, you know? And uh, the main guy, we'll call him Ronald. I says to Ronald one day, I says, hey, could I start getting ounces off you guys? And he knew me for a while at this point. And he goes, "Uh, you can get it under one condition. And I'm like, what's that? He says, if you start getting it off us, you're not allowed to get it off anybody else. I'm like, why? Because we have really good shit, and if you're working with us, and then and then you stop working with us, and then you start selling crap, then it'll ruin our reputation. So I was like, "Fuck, that's a bit of a commitment." But uh, but they had the best coke around, so I was like, "Okay." And then he says, "There's one other thing: if you ever rat on us, we'll kill your whole family." Mm. And uh, I was like, "Fuck!" Like, well, I never ratted on anybody before. I wasn't going to start now, so I was like. Yeah, I can, I can, I can. Like, I can. That's not a problem. Yeah, I was like. But you were the, all, I mean, were you, how How did you, I guess you had established some level of trust, but like, how do you ingratiate yourself into that community of people? I mean, you were, there couldn't have been any other non-Asian well, here, people I'll, working I'll, with I'll, that I'll tell, I'll tell you now, right? So just to finish how I was, how I joined those guys. Um, so, so he says, if you ever rat on us, we'll kill your whole family. And I said, okay, I won't rat on you. And he goes, if you're ever arrested, just keep your mouth shut and the lawyer will be provided for you. And that's what he told me. And he said, and the other good thing about working with us, if anybody fucks with you, we'll be up there with machine guns. Mm. I was like, fuck, okay, this is really serious. So that was me in with them. But before that, I had I had got coke off other people as well. But in San Francisco, it might be the same now, I don't know. But there's a few Asian gangs that supply all the Irish people with coke. There's a chick, a Vietnamese chick. I won't tell you what her name is, but she's one of the big, big suppliers there. And 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 then there was my guys, uh, Ronald and uh, Leroy. Leroy was kind of like off the boat Asian dude. He like never wore any shoes or socks when he was driving, you know. And then there was another guy called Johnny Go Anywhere. He was a, another Asian taxi driver. He had these business cards that said Johnny Taxi, Go Anywhere. So his nickname mm-hmm. was Johnny Go Anywhere. But uh, Johnny got killed around... 2007, 2008, yeah, somebody called him to go somewhere and he pulled up in the sunset and they shot him in the head and his car drove into a fucking uh, a house and exploded. Wow. But uh, yeah, the, the word was that the chick, the other rival killed him, but I heard it was Chinese money lenders. But, but yeah, long story short, there's a lot of Asian gangs up there. Yeah. So you start working with this Asian gang, you're dealing, you're married, you got a girlfriend, you're out all night. Like, it seems pretty insane. Then you have this accident on a construction site that breaks your back. Like, there's a lot of chaos that's well, I got coming the, into your I, life. I had the accident after I got sober. Oh, that happened after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was yeah. I was all good while I was using and, you uh-huh. know, things. Well, I wasn't all good, but yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was working with these Asian guys for a while and, and uh, selling coke. And I was selling Viagra as well. Um <laughs> Yeah, there's a thing. I don't know if any of you coke heads out there. There's a thing where if you take too much coke, you get this thing called coke dick. So if you have Viagra with you, you can avoid that that situation. Right. You know. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So so I used to sell the little the little blue pills as well. That was that was part of my thing. But um, yeah, things got really crazy around 2009. Um, but let, walk walk me up into the bottom. Yeah, this is and coming the to the bottom. Point, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is coming to the bottom. Um, so let's just say somebody hurted somebody I, I really cared about, and and uh, and I decided they'd have to be be killed, right? And um, so I went about hiring a hitman to 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 kill this guy. And uh, first, I tried my gang. I asked Ronald, would they do it for a price? And he said that they would only kill somebody who had fucked us over in business. They wouldn't kill anybody for personal reasons. 
And he told me he had killed a bunch of people when he was younger, and he told me that they, they haunted him, you know. So so he's, he was trying to talk me out of it. I didn't want to, or he didn't want to do it. And then I knew this Norteño guy, Mexican mafia fella called Joe. And uh, I asked Joe, would he do it? And Joe said he'd do it for 5000 I only had 2000 <laughs> So I says, Joe, I'll, I'll give you two. I, I only have 2000 He's like, no, no, that's not enough money. So then I decided I was going to rob this bar in San Francisco. So there used to be, it's gone now, but it, it was a money laundering operation for the Irish terrorists. Mm -hmm. And uh, This just sounds like such a good plan. <laughs> Well, it, 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 cocaine gave me these kind of good yeah. ideas, or you know. I mean, it's it's a comedy of errors, like out of a Coen Brothers movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the sad thing is, it's fucking true. Like, um, so basically, this place would have a half million dollars behind the bar every Friday. So if you had a check, and if you were, say, if you had problems with the IRS or child support, or you were an illegal immigrant, you could bring your check into the bar, and they'd cash the check for you and give you give you cash for it, and you tip the barman. That's that's how how the thing worked, and I knew somebody who worked there, and I said, uh, well, I knew it could be robbed, but it was like a two man job. Like one person would have to watch the customers, and the other person could go in and get the money. And uh, so I was like trying to get some of the guys I I hung around with to do it, but they were all too scared. And, and then I asked the girlfriend to do it with me, and she was scared too. And uh, we ended up not being able to do it, and then. I get a call from Joe. Joe got a DUI, so he badly needed the money. He says, I'll kill the guy for 2000 Just, you have to get the gun. So uh, 2000 isn't a lot of money, so he's not spending that fucking money on, on getting the gun. Right. So I had to pr provide the gun for him. And I had my own gun, but it was a legal one. And you can't, if you have a registered gun, you can't kill somebody with that because it can be traced to sure. you. So... I hit up this guy, Silva, another fellow I knew, um, asked him if he could give me a gun. And uh, he said, yeah, come to the mission. And before this, I had been on like a really bad bender. Uh, it was around Burning Man time. And this undertaker from Ireland was going to Burning Man and he wanted a half ounce of Coke. So I got, I got an ounce, gave him half the ounce and the other half went up my nose. So I was awake for a few days and, and uh, I drove down to the mission to meet Silva and I was like sleepwalking around the place, sweaty, fucking on edge, you know. And when I got there, he saw how bad I was and he's like, I'm not giving this fool a gun, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Right. He didn't say that to me, but I know that's what he was thinking. So so uh, I ended up not, not getting the gun off him. So I'm driving back to my house uh, out by the beach and fucking cops start following me um up i was driving up fulton and, and the cops followed me and i'm all sweaty and i have an ounce in the glove compartment and i have a 22 under the seat so i'm i'm sitting in a jail sentence if they catch me yeah. so they fucking followed me and then the, the the lights come on and the siren and i'm like fuck i'm nearly having a heart attack and then they turned around and went back the way they came they must have got a call on the fucking on the radio and I nearly had a heart attack. My my heart was coming through my chest. So I pulled over, I smoked like fucking five cigarettes and I was like, I'm not going to jail for killing this fool. And uh, and I decided, I decided I would go to Australia. Right. Instead. As one would. <laughs> yeah, right? so so yeah, I figured, <laughs> I was like, fuck it. If yeah. I, I, I thought San Francisco's the problem. I need to get the fuck out of here. Right. I, like there was a recession in America, but Australia was booming. There was loads of Irish going to Australia. So I decided to go to Australia. Fucking hopped on a on a plane. We'll make a long story short. I, I, I hopped on a plane on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, and I went to Australia. I was never going to come back. And I was like, fuck America. You know? <laughs> yeah. And you went with your girlfriend. Yeah. I and the your girlfriend. wife was at home in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah the like the insanity level is yeah, through the is roof on all of this. Different level. Like, and the other thing was, I didn't even want the girlfriend to come with me because, like, um, this was towards the end of 2009. And I was like really suicidal, but I thought if I could get out of America, I wouldn't do mm -hmm. it. Like, and I, I was staying at the girlfriend's house and I was, I was so fucking high. And, and, uh, 
and I just wanted to book my flights to Australia. You could get a visa online. It was really easy. Like, I just wanted to book my flights and get the fuck out of there. And uh, she, t- she was an accountant, right? The girlfriend was. And, and so she wanted to give two weeks notice. Uh, <laughs> she wanted to give two weeks notice before, before we leave. And I was like, no, no, I can go now and you can meet me over there. I can't wait two weeks. I was on death's door. Like, and, uh, and I got on the computer in her house to fucking book my tickets for Australia. And she turned the internet off in the house. Uh-huh. And I was like, fuck, I'm trapped happen. in Daly City. And, uh, and she came back in and I was high as a kite. And she told me the raccoons had eaten the cables outside, and that's why the internet was mm-hmm. off. And I, I was high, but I wasn't that fucking high. <laughs> I knew that she turned the fucking internet off because uh, she wanted me to wait. So I, I was stuck there, and I was like so wasted. I couldn't go to like an internet cafe or something like that. I would, I would have called the police. I was so bad. Like, so I was stuck there, and I was like mad at her for keeping me there, you know. Um, in the end, she she eventually turned on the fucking internet and everything, and we both left on New Year's Eve. And I was thinking, I'm finished with this this chick as soon as we get to Australia. <laughs> right, and you go to Australia; it's a disaster. Yeah, color to post. More of the same shit. Lots of fighting, fist fights. Lots of visits to the whorehouse. Lots of drinking. It was crazy in Australia too. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so where do you where do you meet your maker and finally realize like I can't I, so I, I stayed can't in Australia for like three or four months and I missed the kids as well so I decided to come back to America and then when I came you back have two kids at this point yeah two kids yeah and and um yeah and I, I I came back and I was trying to be sober and and in the end I just became suicidal I was I was gonna gonna shoot myself again and uh you know, even though I was a drug addict, I was a pretty good carpenter. I, I could always get work. And there's a bunch of Irish guys in San Francisco who were sober. And they go to the 12-step meetings and they don't make any secret of it. And I, I, I ended up working with some of these guys. And one of them was a guy called Bernard. Or Americans would say Bernard. Yeah. But Amer- uh, Irish call him Bernard. So Bernard, he knew I had a problem. And we used to work together. And I, I, I would always be curious about the meetings. So I'd like ask him questions. And she'd what goes on at these meetings? And uh, he, did, he didn't want to tell me a whole lot. But he just gave me his number. And he says, if you ever want to get sober, give me a call. So I says, right. And uh, for some reason, that time I was suicidal again. I decided to give him a call. And uh, because I had already tried to kill myself so many times. And it you know, wasn't working out. And I tried to do it on my own. Like I tried to tried to stop drinking, and I it, my record was three months, mm-hmm. like off everything. And, yeah, and, and but every good alcoholic has that experience of yeah. a couple months off, which just fuels that idea that you can do it yourself. Yeah, like the game is to prove you're not an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. So like I could stay sober for three months, so that proves I'm not an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Let's drink, <laughs> you know. By the end of the three months, I would be bursting for a drink. And then there was other rules, excuse me, like uh, alcoholics drink in the house. I knew that. So I never drank in the house. I was like, oh, that's alcoholic shit. So I'd always drink, I'd always drink at the bar. And uh, I knew alcoholics drank in the morning. So I never drank in the morning. I suffered all those hangovers for all those years. And then when I came to the meetings, people were like, oh, yeah, I used to drink in the morning to help me feel better. And I was like, fuck, I never did that. I suffered all these hangovers for all these years. So it led me to this point where... where um, what made me call Bernard? Um, I, I was doing this job out in the East Bay, and and I had just tried to kill myself a few weeks beforehand, and I knew I didn't want to drink again. And I would be driving home from work, and I could feel something was pulling me to go to the bar, because I didn't drink at home, drank at the bar, and and this something that wasn't me was pulling me to go to the bar, and and I was able to observe it, whereas it had been there all along, but. But it was in the background, but I could I could feel there's some shit that's fucking not me that makes wants me want to drink. So uh, I called up Bernard and he says, Well, Richie, how are you doing? I says, uh, Bernard, I have a problem with the drinking and the drugs. Uh, can you bring me to a meeting? And he goes, I'll pick you up this evening. So he came and he picked me up, and and that's that was Labor Day 2010. Right. That's where and that I was it. started. The guy becomes your sponsor, not immediately, but 
<clears throat> you know, he's your Eskimo. He brings you into this whole other world and hence begins the slog into sobriety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really weird. Like, um, I didn't know a whole lot about sobriety. Like in Ireland, it's kind of, it's, at least when I was growing up, it was more underground. Like, you, you know, you wouldn't know shit about it. Like, mm. Even now, what, the last few years. So it must be weird in LA where just everybody's talking about it like yeah. a badge of honor. Like people in restaurants would be like fucking working the steps in, the, in a restaurant with their sponsor. That was so weird to me. Like like back home, it's like so secret. You know, when you're there, you would be saying, oh, he's a member. It's like Fight Club or some shit back home. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, because uh, in Ireland, you have to be really bad to go to AA. Because like, cause like when I first got sober, I started coming home and, and a lot of my old drinking buddies like tits and the boys like that, I, they, I go to the pub to meet them, but I, I'd be like, uh, well, what are you drinking? I'm like, a Coke. Oh, you're not drinking. I'm like, no, I'm an alcoholic. Cause oh, you're not a fucking alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. cause if I'm an alcoholic, right. they could be. Yeah. Like, they don't want to have to look at their own behavior. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think to hit that, that grade of of maybe surrender in Ireland, you probably have to be a lot lot worse than than over here, you know. Mm. Right. So he brings you to meetings in San Francisco. This becomes like your thing, man. I mean, you too. What's interesting is that that um, you didn't relapse. No, I was very fortunate, but it was weird though, uh, Rich. It wasn't like I never relapsed, but I was at a point where I was willing to fucking do whatever was suggested right. to me, at least on, on face value. Yeah. Well, talk about the willingness piece. That's, that's something I talk about all the time. Like that idea that you can't, you can't compel somebody to get sober. Like it has to be this internally driven desire, a true willingness where you're ready and prepared to do whatever it takes. Yeah. And I didn't even really, at the start, I, I didn't even really think it would necessarily work for me. You know, um, because as I said before, I knew I had a problem with the sauce and the cocaine, but I, I thought like maybe I have some kind of mental problems. Like maybe I'm fucking depressed or manic depressant or bipolar or some shit. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I really did, did because I didn't understand uh, the mental traits of somebody who has a problem like this, you know. And, and, and I, I knew that alcoholics drank every day, but I didn't drink every day. I was like, a, I was a, a binge drinker. Like I, I, sometimes I could stay sober for a couple of weeks, but then I would just drink to extreme when I did. So, so my understanding was that I'm probably not an alcoholic, you know, until I came there. And then when I came to the first meeting, I was really nervous, dude. Like, like, so all the Irish know each other in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. That's where it was. And I, I knew that the Irish center had meetings, right? I didn't want to go to the Irish Center, right? Because that'll it'll it'll get leaked out. Yeah, find it's like, oh, Richie comments. Stevens has a problem. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, I didn't mind them knowing I was a drug dealer, piece of shit, or anything like that. This is how warped my thinking was at the time. Didn't mind them knowing that I was a drug dealer, that I was a bad guy, but I didn't want them to think I had a problem. So Bernard picked me up that day, and uh, there was another guy with him, Niall. I never met him before, but the two guys were in the front, and I was in the back. And I was really nervous because I didn't want the fucking Irish people to know. And this guy, Niall, was Irish too, who was in the car with me. Like, and I was so fucking nervous, dude. I, I says, uh, where are we going? And Bernard says, we're going to the Irish center. And I'm like, fuck. And, and the car was already moving. So I, I was like, I have to go to the fucking Irish center now, you know? And they, they knew I was really nervous, you know? And it was quiet in the car. And Bernard turns around and he says, did you bring your passport? I said, what? Did you bring your passport? I was like, no. I thought it was like a setup with the cops to be waiting for me to have my passport to deport me. <laughs> I says, no, why? And, he, and then he started laughing. He had this fucking Santa Claus laugh. <laughs> like this. And he, but he was just breaking my balls. Like, you know, uh, and, and that kind of took the, the edge off. Like they were kind of making fun of me because they knew I was nervous. Mm. You know, he's just fucking with me. So it kind of broke the ice a little bit. We got up to the Irish Centre, we parked the car, and, I, and I, I was like looking around, fucking make sure nobody saw me going in or anything like that, you know. Yeah. It was in the no Richie Stevens has a fucking problem. Like, like yeah. Shit. Yeah. And, and this guy stopped me at the door, like uh, a northern fella called Stephen. He says, Well, how are you? Are you new? 
I was thinking, how the fuck does he know I'm new? <laughs> you know? But the thing is, if you ever go to the meetings, of course they know if you're yeah. new because the same fucking people go every week. And if you're new, you probably look like shit as well. So I, I couldn't have been looking yeah. too hot after the session I had been on. So I was like, yeah, I am new. He goes, do you think you have a problem with drinking? I says, yeah. He says, what makes you say that? I says, well, I just tried to kill myself a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, that'll do it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and then in, in I went and I sat down and it was a fucking, it was a men only meeting on a Friday night. And there was a good few Irish lads there, you know, like people like me, construction workers. And, and I came in, I sat down and, you know, I, I knew that like from whatever I had seen on TV or any of this shit, I thought if you come to a fucking meeting, you have to tell everybody your story or you have to talk in front of a group. And like, that's, that scared the shit out of me. You know, I could go around carrying a gun and, 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 and deal with the people I was dealing with. That didn't scare me, but being honest in front of a, a group yeah. of, uh, of other drunks about my embarrassing shit, that scared the shit out of me. So I was, I was like, intent on not fucking telling anybody anything, sit at the back, you know, keep to myself. And uh, so I sat down in the back and, and uh, everybody was, was shaking my hand and saying hello. And I was just trying to keep a low prof profile. And uh, at the start of the meeting, the guy says, uh, have we any newcomers here tonight? And everybody like, turns around and looks at me like, and uh, I, I would have like pretend fucking or give a fake name or something like that and just leave. But Bernard and Niall already knew who I was, so they put up the hand, and, and uh, I was like, I'm Richie. I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. And I had never, I don't think I had ever admitted that before mm -hmm. in a group, like, and uh, and I couldn't believe it. They all fucking clapped. And uh, I was like, wow, do you people know who I am? Like, the things I have done? And, uh, but didn't give a fuck. Some of them did, but uh, they didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. all, they thought, all they cared about was, there's a dude here who has a problem. And, you know, we're going to help them out for fun and for free. And I, I, it really, it, I couldn't believe they were clapping for me. That, uh, that really, like, not what I was expecting, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah, so, so you say that out loud for the first time, but at what point did you believe that about yourself, like, prior to that? Because you thought it was some other mental defect or you were making rationalizations or excuses for yourself. But deep down, when your head hit the pillow... You knew, like, well, you knew you were an alcoholic. When I started drug drinking addict. at the age of 15 or 16, I knew I had a problem back then. But you push I, it way down. Yeah. Like, I remember one time going to the doctor. You know, when you go to the doctor's office and there's a bunch of leaflets and shit like that sitting around. And it's, it's in Ireland, same as here. You'd have a bunch of leaflets and shit in the doctor's office. I remember when I was a kid, like a teenager, I saw one of these leaflets. And it was a, an alcoholic questionnaire. I think it's called yeah. the 20 questions. I think yeah, that's yeah. what it's called. So I remember as a kid fucking opening this shit up when I was at the doctor's office and I had just discovered drinking at this time. And I'm reading through the questions. Do you ever do things you regret while you're drinking? Oh, who doesn't? Do you ever lie about your drinking? Of course. <laughs> you know, <laughs> have you ever blacked out? Oh, it happens to everybody. Yeah. And I remember back then when I had done the questionnaire, I probably got 16 or 17 out of 20. Mm -hmm. And if you ever do that questionnaire, they say, they say one yes means you might be an alcoholic. Two yeses mean you're probably an alcoholic. Three or more, you are definitely an alcoholic. Yeah. So I saw it in black and white when I was a fucking teenager, right. but, I, but I thought it was a joke, you know? I was like, everybody drinks in Ireland, you know? It's like, it's in our culture, it's in our blood, like, you know? So, so I knew I had a problem from the start. But, but when you're doing the steps, right, you're li it's admitted you're powerless over drugs and alcohol and your life is unmanageable. So I knew I was powerless from a teenager, but I thought my life was manageable. Mm -hmm. if, if you looked on, from the outside looking in, you'd say, this guy's a fucking a fiend, like, you know, but, but until the very end, I probably hadn't admit, admitted that second part that my life was right, unmanageable. Right, and that's the the baffling thing because any outside observer would say this is nothing but chaos and insanity. But your lived experience was I, this is under control. I'm managing this all right. Yeah, in my own head. Yeah, 
you know? But but obviously not in everybody else's head. <laughs> <laughs> no. The right. people I was working with, <laughs> you know, the dolls I was seeing, my wife, obviously. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get to the wife. But first, uh, you know, one of the things I appreciate, appreciated about the book is your candor around the character defect piece, because there is this idea that when you get sober, like it's just about getting rid of the drugs and alcohol, and then all my problems are going to go away. Mm. And what you don't realize is that then, you know, you have all of these emotions that come to the surface that become very unmanageable until you learn these new tools for how to work through them. And in your case, like a lot of it goes back to the anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, Basically, when you when you're getting sober, right, it's really difficult when when to take away your medicine because the booze is your medicine. If you're an alcoholic, the booze is what you use to feel good or to deal with all your problems. For me, like any time I had any kind of a feeling, the impulse was to to drink or get high. Like if I was happy about something, yeah, let's celebrate. If you're sad about something, draw on your sorrows. If you're angry about something, mm. need a drink to calm you down. It was literally my so solution for everything, even boredom. Fuck, I've nothing to do. Let's go to the bar. So, so if you have a problem with drinking and drugs, like that's your life. And then to suddenly have your your comfort taken away, you're raw as fuck. Like, you know. So, so um, when when someone's newly sober, they're definitely really irritable and like you were saying with the the defects of character there's no such thing as a perfect person i still have defects of character obviously but um they're more obvious when the booze is gone and your head is clear and you have to get real about what these what these problems you have mm -hmm. like for me um i would say yeah quick to anger was one you know uh I probably got as many beatings as I gave, you know, but violence was uh, was a way to solve problems. I never hit my missus or my kids or anything like that, but other dudes, like, you know, and, and uh, that's not how you behave. Like, when I came to the meetings, they says, it's a spiritual program. And I said, what the fuck is spiritual? And I have a college education, but I, ne I never used the word sp spiritual. It wasn't in my vocabulary. Like, I was like, what, what does that mean? Do we all fucking sit around and do yoga or, or become vegan uh -huh. or what the fuck is that? You know, the, 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 that's, what I was, that's what I thought originally. Maybe. Man, it was not, not, not me, but, but, uh, but yeah, so, so I, 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 I heard, it, like, you hear these people at the meetings and be like, yeah, it's a spiritual program. This is what the fuck is spiritual? And uh, the best definition I got, uh, an old priest I talked to at uh, one of the meetings, he said, spirituality is freedom from the bondage of self. So yeah. I had bondage of self. That's why I was drinking and doing all these drugs. Like, I was like, okay, that sounds cool. The, the booze and the coke used to be my spirituality. How the fuck do I, how do, how do I feel good now without that stuff? And they said it's very simple. You just, uh, you just, you just do whatever your sponsor suggests. Uh, you try to be honest. You try to help other people instead of just thinking about yourself. And and uh, and and you do other shit like praying and meditating if you want to do that kind of stuff. Like I didn't do that kind of stuff at the beginning, but uh, yeah, I slowly learned the tools to not have to drink and and and. Uh, and get high anymore and and it was a learning process and and slowly my feelings started to become more normal the highs weren't so high the lows weren't so low mm -hmm. you know right and there's that fear that comes with that because there is an addiction to those highs and lows mm -hmm. on some level like what is my life going to be like if i'm just flatlining all the time mm -hmm. you know i can't live that way yeah. It's going to be boring. It's going to be intolerable. Yeah, I thought, before I actually decided to get sober, like when I decided to get sober, there was no more options. I was like, yeah. it's either do this or die. But before that, the concept of like getting sober, maybe even going to meetings or something like that, I thought it would be like, 
the most boring shit ever. I thought it would be like a bunch of people fucking hanging out in a room, trying not to drink, you know, like kind of sad and pathetic. But it, it turned out to be the exact opposite for me. Um, the people I've met in in, in recovery are, are the most interesting people, the people who were like me so fucked up that they that they couldn't do it anymore, you know. And, and there was a lot of fun around it. And, and I learned how to do normal things sober. Like, there's this thing that they do. Another new word for me was fellowship. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait, what the fuck is fellowship? Um, Bernard said to me one day when I was new at the meetings, I was just, I was just getting like, I was just getting stuck in at the start. And he says, we're going to meet for coffee. Meet me at the coffee shop. And I says, go for coffee? What the fuck are we going to do there? And he goes, we're going to talk and drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and that was like that was weird to me as well because uh, since i was a kid when you're in a social fucking surrounding you want to have a beer and and it, but it was a catch-22 with me like before i got sober if i was in a social setting some shit like this where i didn't really know the people and, and i might feel nervous i'd want a beer just to feel okay and, and then the problem was <laughs> once i started drinking the beer i drink too much beer and then I started making a fool of myself. So it was, even when I was drinking, it was a no-win situation. So we had to like, so so I remember the first time we went to the coffee shop and we were drinking coffee and just chatting. It was like, it was weird. Like, but but uh, I got used to it fairly quick because uh, um, there was something about being around other people who were the same as me, who had the same problem as me. It, I found to have a connection to other people who have my problem. There's something about talking to another fucking drunk or another addict that uh, they understand you, you mm -hmm. know. So, and 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 I I used to trip out so much uh, about it at the start. I'm like, oh, how am I never going to drink again? Fucking, what if my parents die, or or, or what if my my daughter gets married in twenty years and I'm and I'm at her wedding? Will I not be able to have a glass of champagne or whatever? And uh, Bernard he says to me, he says, never mind that shit. He says, we we do it one day at a time. So today you don't feel like drinking. Maybe tomorrow you won't eat or don't worry about fucking 20 years time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Those annoying adages that are so true. Yeah. 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 There was a bunch of them like fucking easy does it. That, that, was, that was an important one for me too because everything <laughs> was such a big deal when I got sober. Like, oh God, the wife annoyed me or some of the boys at work be like fucking Greek tragedy. Like, you yeah. know, they'd say easy does it. Yeah. Well, that means just take it easy. Don't worry about that shit. And uh, the other thing is like the levity, right? You talk about in the book, like the first time that you kind of really shared your whole story in a group setting and the fear around that. But in that community, like it's so, um, it's so welcomed, right? Like that level of, because it takes courage to be vulnerable on that level, right? But tapping into that vulnerability becomes part of the healing process. And we can laugh at this stuff that we've done and that has happened in the past, even though we're also appreciating the heaviness of it and kind of where it took us. And that's like a salve in the wound, right? To sit and listen to other people's version of your story how they got through it and and the and and the kind of ownership like this is what happened i'm not ashamed to talk about it because i've done all of this work to repair my relationships make peace with my past overcome those resentments and and everything like that that is really like when someone walks into the room and can share as openly as you just have about all these things that you've done like i think that's that's something that helps us feel more connected to other people yeah, like for me, it didn't come easy to me. Like, you know, I'm nearly 12 years sober now, so I've told my story fucking at least 50 times to groups of people. But um, it was very difficult for me to share at the start because most people who are in recovery haven't done the things I did, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think the first person I heard speaking who had a similar story to me was, was a, a Hell's Angel. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember when I heard his story and it actually gave me a kind of a sense of relief that like, because I always feel like I'm the worst person in the room. Like, and, you know, I am ashamed of some of the things I've done. Like, you can't be proud of some of this shit. But the bottom line is it happened 
and and uh, it was at a time in my life where I was powerless over something. You know, I I wouldn't have made those kind of decisions today, like how I am. And I, I'm not proud of like a lot of the stuff I've done, but but it it happened. Like yeah. you know, it's the truth. And um, I was most worried about, um, you know, what if I tell these people about this shit that I've done and they think I'm a fucking asshole? Like I feel like I am, you know. Um, what if they don't want to know me? Like and and. Uh, it, like ex- expecting judgment from people. And of course, some people are going to judge you. It's not like things I have done aren't things to be proud of. Like I'm lucky I'm not dead or in jail mm-hmm. for the things that I have done. But, but I'm being, but when, when I'm asked to share at a group, I do because it might help somebody else who like maybe feels like they're the biggest piece of shit in the room too. Yeah. Like, or maybe they have something that, that they have done that they're not proud of, you know? How have you stayed plugged in after almost 12 years? Because you really embrace the program and and you're an ambassador, you know, in a, in a very service forward way to a lot of people. Yeah. So I had a bit of bad luck at the end of my first year. And... um so after I got sober, I turned my back on criminal lifestyle completely out of it. No more, no more drug dealing or any of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and I tried to switch my life around and fucking get everything back on track. I tried to fix my marriage, um, tried to become a productive member of society. And uh, I wanted to be a contractor, you know, um, construction business because I was a carpenter Mm -hmm. I had the skills and experience even though I was high as a kite a lot of the time I had been doing it and uh, so I I took the test to get my contractor license and that that's what my plan was I'm gonna gonna build houses for the next fucking 30 years that's where I thought my life was gonna go that's what my plan was and then I got into an accident construction accident and I broke my back a beam fell down and hit me Broke one of my discs, herniated another one. It's permanently damaged. So I had to stop being a carpenter. And uh, it, it, it would have been very easy to go back drinking at that time because I was feeling sorry for myself. Mm. And I thought, oh, I got sober now. Everything should be cool, you know. But, but the thing is, like, whether you're sober or not, sometimes bad things happen, you know. And uh, what got me through that time, it was around the time when when I had just finished my steps in the program and the last step is you, you got to like help others, work with other people. So I ended up sponsoring some other guys who, who uh, were trying to get sober and, and that kept me out of the, the self pity. Like, um, cause there's something about working with somebody else that it's hard to feel sorry for yourself when you're trying to help somebody else. You know, it's, it's yeah. impossible to do both at the same time. So I started working with others and that got me through uh, a hard part in my life. And and I ended up doing what I'm doing now. It, uh, something I I enjoy far more. I got into acting and moved down here uh, to LA. But uh, part of it is part of it is like if you want if you want to keep what you've got, you got to give it away. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't say which programs I go to, but I go to multiple. You know, there's there's a few things wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so it's not just you know. Right. Uh, so yeah, I still I still try and be a service to others where I can, and and uh, and if it's not broke, don't fix it. So so I keep on doing the same shit that I, I was taught at the beginning. Yeah, there's a bit of a, a comparison to Barry in your story. Here you are, this guy, you know, who's who's living this gangster lifestyle, and then you become you become an actor. <laughs> And it's hard to not like, you know, think about Barry when I think about your arc. Mm. I suppose it is like Barry, except mine's a true story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. And you weren't, you weren't a hip man, let's be clear. No, I never yeah. killed anybody, thank God. <laughs> um, but it is, it is, there is a, there's sort of a comedic undertone to that as well. Yeah. I don't, you know. You I, come down here and then you start playing gangsters and heavies and bad guys and, you know, all these procedural shows. Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of like, I didn't choose to do that either. It was, it, it, it chose me. I wow. didn't like start acting and go, I just, I want to play bad guys. It's like, you look like a bad guy. Right. You'll play bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how And you've happened. been at it for a while, man. Mm-hmm. You're doing good. Yeah. I've been in a lot of shows and uh, I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the wife and the kids. 
how's everything going there? Ex-wife uh, now. I'm divorced. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a good relationship with my kids. Uh, uh, they were only toddlers when, when I got sober and they're teenagers now. And, uh, yeah, I just try to be a good dad. And they it, live in San Francisco. Yeah, they, they, they live with the, the ex-wife. Yeah. And it, it was kind of a weird one because I had to tell them a bit about my story because they had no idea about how I used to behave because they were only right. babies when I got sober. So they, But you're, you, I mean, you, it's it sounds like life for your wife was an absolute living hell. Oh yeah, like I'm sure I'm sure uh, I was not fucking husband of the year for any of those years or father of the year, you know. Um yeah, so obviously she 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 won't have that good of an opinion of me especially since we got divorced, but um there's nothing I can do about that, you know. I just try and be a good dad to my kids, but it's kind of weird like having to tell the kids about some of the stuff I used to do cuz they didn't know about any of this shit. And I was like, oh, "Well, I wrote this book and you know, I'm going to have to tell you some of these stories. So, so how does your ex-wife feel about the book? You'd have to ask her about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not close or anything like that, but we, we, we co-parent, you mm -hmm. know. And so you go up and visit the kids or how does that work? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I get them every month. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how does the, the book come about in this relationship with, with John and Dave? Oh, so. I mean, the book opens with, with them talking about how they met you and 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 kind of it it being its own little miracle because ordinarily they would have no, you would just sort of cold emailed them yeah I did. ordinarily They're, they would have never even opened that email they didn't know me from Adam so so basically and, to, and explain who these guys are okay so John Old Schuler and Dave Krinsky. they're the co-creators of Silicon Valley and they were showrunners on King of the Hill they wrote Blades of Glory starring um, Will Ferrell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're, uh, they're 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 successful uh, yeah, they're, writers they're and big time showrunners. Hollywood showrunners and yeah. writers. Yeah, and the way it came about, it was it was a funny thing. Uh, so one of my buddies, a guy called Sean Sean Mann, he's 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 another actor. We moved to LA around the same time. He's a really good guy, and he was he was working on this comedy project, and I was helping him do a little bit of producing on it, and and. Uh, you guys want to see it? I think it's on YouTube. It's pretty funny. He did like a, a proof of concept. It's called Roommates. So he says, "See if you can get me some some someone big attached to this, and and uh, if you can help me out." So I was just helping Sean out. So I was like, "This is this is a good comedy. It's it's kind of a an out there comedy that that he was he he had created." And so I looked at who were the best comedy people, and at the time Silicon Valley was was one of the top ones. So. I reached out to like a couple of people. The first one was Danny McBride. I got, I, I got Danny McBride's email. I, I emailed him and then his assistant got back and said, we don't accept unsolicited materials. Mm -hmm. And then I sent it to John and, uh, and John, John responded and he said, this is cool. Let's meet. And, uh, we met up with John and, and right, uh, which is highly, highly unusual. Yeah, that that's kind of, not you know that's not how things work. That kind of shit yeah. doesn't happen really. <laughs> yeah. yeah, usually if you send unsolicited materials to to top for people, legal reasons alone, they yeah, don't do it. But other than like, who is this guy? Yeah. Like, you're not going to get the time of day from. Anybody. Yeah, exactly. But uh, it just turns out that they were really nice guys, and uh, and we ended up meeting up with them, and and that particular project wasn't a fit for John, but. He said, I like you guys. Keep sending me stuff. So I sent him another couple of things and he passed on those. And then I had I had written my original draft of the book and I sent that to him and he liked it. And then he, he read like 50 pages of it and, and he says, I like this, but I don't really know where it's going. So then I told him about my past and, and uh, he was like, let's meet again. Because the first time that we met, he he had no idea I used to be yeah. a gangster or anything like that. I'm not scary in person. I'm, I'm friendly. Like, And then... We met up again and I told him a couple of yarns and uh, he's like, wow, this is crazy. Do you want a partner on it? And, and I said, okay. And then, uh, so first of all, uh, he has another show coming out. I'm, I'm not allowed to say what it is, but basically it's about somebody who's an author. And then he put, a, put us in touch with uh, our book agents and the book agents read the book and they were like, wow, this is, this is, a, this is pretty crazy, but I don't know how to sell it. And then John had the idea of rewriting the book in the format of the 12 steps 
because so it would be shorter and more accessible to to what my story really is. And then we rewrote the book together. And um, the book is coming out on uh, May 24th. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be a TV show as well. So what's the deal with the TV show? Like, is that a, a, a pilot deal or a series deal? And what's the status of development there? Like, how, you know, well, we were, it's one thing like, oh, there's going to be a show. Well, there's we, a long, you know, a lot of things have to happen before something ends up on, on the air, right? Well, we took it into um, uh, John's manager before we, 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 the book was, was done. And he, he said, uh, he said, you should get a book, you should get a book deal first because it's easier to green light. And then we got we got the book deal, and uh, we have a bunch of people who are interested in it right now. Um, we don't know where it's going to land yet, yeah. but uh, but uh, I can't really say who's looking at it. But uh, some cool people. It's exciting, man. Yeah, it's yeah. quite an arc. It's when you crazy. look back on the whole thing, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty miraculous. Yeah, it's kind of unbelievable. Like uh, <laughs> number one, that I'm alive after all this kind of stuff, and yeah. It's it's pretty crazy. Do you find that that makes it easier to connect with gratitude and all yeah, of that? Absolutely. Like yeah. you know, um, they told me when I got sober, if if you stay grateful, you won't ever drink again. So I have a lot of things to be grateful for, and and um, yeah, I have a, I have a crazy life yeah. today. But it's pretty balanced now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there, the the only drama I have is is on the stage now. Thank God, and try and keep it that way. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you're still auditioning and doing that whole doing mm -hmm. that whole deal. You did some movie with Halle Berry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that a few years ago. Uh, that was uh, that was called Kings, and last year I didn't I, see that one. Yeah, that was about the Rodney King riots, and I did last year. I did Days of Our Lives and. NCIS, and I've done Blue Bloods, Criminal Minds. All the procedures. MacGyver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. I, I've, I've been bad guy of the week a lot of times. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's cool, man. Um, well, let's let's round this out with uh, <clears throat> some some words of, of wisdom for for the person out there who's, who's still suffering, um, whether or not they're an alcoholic or a drug addict or just battling with some kind of substance or addiction related issue how do you communicate to that person throw them a lifeline and and kind of uh you know help them figure out a better path forward well i would just say like no matter how bad you think things are it can still you can still have it can still be fixed like i kind of thought that I was just going to be messed up forever and that I, I didn't think that it would work for me. Um, and, and I've seen it working for a lot of people. So all you have to do is ask for help and the help is there if you want to take it. Easier said than done sometimes. Yeah. You have to be fully cooked. You know, the best advice I ever got when I was out and about one of those sober guys, I was working with him, uh, and and I was came in really hung over, like, and uh, he says, "Why do you do this to yourself?" And I looked at him and I was like, "Do you think I'm an alcoholic?" He says, "Of course you're a fucking alcoholic." <laughs> and uh, I was like, "Why?" He's like, "You're fucking, you're doing coke with hookers in, in motels, like fucking non-alcoholics don't do that shit." And. Uh, <laughs> And then I was like, well, do you think I should go to the meetings? He goes, no, not yet. He says, keep on doing it until you can't do it anymore. If, you, if you're not ready, it won't work. Mm -hmm. He said, you have to. Research. Yeah. He, sa he says, keep going until you're cooked. And then you'll know when you can't do it anymore. Then you go. Yeah. If you're ready, you're ready. It's all about willingness. Yeah. You can summon that willingness and, and, and do the thing like yourself. Um, I've seen so many lives change and transform. So it is possible. And I think the real inspirational piece in your story relates to that arc. Like, honestly, your story is so insane. So 
if you could figure this out and get sober, like, I think it, it, it provides a lot of hope to a well, lot of people. I didn't figure it out on my own either. Like really, I owe my life to that guy, Bernard, who, who brought me to my meet, to you, the meetings. Who you, the, the book is dedicated to him. Yeah. He saved my life. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't be alive only How's for he that. Doing now? He's good. He's over in Canada and he's married and he has a little baby. And is he still your sponsor? No, no, I have a new one now, but, but, uh, yeah, because when he moved home, I got, I got a local guy, but no, we still, we still keep in touch and, uh, yeah, I owe him a lot. Yeah. Good, man. Well, I'm super proud of you. I've had the privilege of, of bearing witness to, uh, part of this arc. <laughs> I remember when you were telling stories about San Francisco, like way back in the day and you've, you've come a long way, my friend. So I'm excited for this book to come out and for everybody to, you know, get a taste of, of, of what your life was all about. And I'm excited for the possibility of this new TV show. And I feel like this is a inflection point in your life. And I would just encourage you to continue to tell your story and to do it with that level of humility and vulnerability that you, that you did today. Cause I think it's, it's, it's really powerful. And I think it has the potential to help a lot of, a lot of people. Thanks a million for having me, Rich. If any of you guys haven't heard Rich before, I would subscribe and like this podcast and <laughs> thanks very much for having me on. And, yeah, man. and, and, uh, yeah, if you guys want to learn some more about me, you can see my, my shit on IMDB. It's Richie Stevens. I'm on Instagram, Richie actor, and the book is coming out on, uh, May 24th, 2022. It's on Amazon, Simon and Schuster, Barnes and Noble and Audible. All uh, the places, yeah. man. So Audible, I wanted to ask final thing. Um, obviously you read the book, right? Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. And you're this master of accents. We got to hear a bunch today. I didn't realize there were so many versions of an Irish accent, but there are. Can you understand um, do you them do all? all the voices, <laughs> like do. the different voices for the different characters in the book? They do, That's a yeah. reason to get it on Audible right there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope you guys understand. <laughs> <Yeah. them. laughs> no, it's good, man. Mm. Um, cool. The book is The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, My Life in 12 Steps. Always a pleasure to see you. And uh I look forward to trudging this road alongside you, my friend. Thanks, Rich. All right. Peace out. 